Okay, the last general topic we're going to look at is refrigeration cycles. And we're going to start by looking at vapor refrigeration cycles. Okay, And, of course, a refrigeration cycle, the point of it is to maintain some cold area region below the temperature of the surroundings. So we're going to start by talking about the reversible best-case Carnot refrigeration cycle, which is basically just turning around the... Uh, power cycle of a Carnot cycle. So uh, I go through a compressor, then through a condenser, through a turbine, then through an evaporator, right? Where the condenser and evaporator are isothermal, the turbine and the compressor are both uh, isentropic. So I get, you know, this ideal situation that we have for a Carnot uh, cycle. And this comes out to give me the maximum coefficient performance, which is basically that cold temperature. Again, my refrigerator is down at the bottom at the cold temperature. This is what I'm trying to do. Okay, So the temperature of that all over the change in temperature between the hot and cold. Of course, this is all in absolute terms. Okay, So that's the best case uh, thing. Now, in actual thing, there's three main differences. First thing is, is that I can't actually have the refrigerator, the the uh, refrigerant temperature, the same as the refrigerator temp. For instance, if I want the refrigerator at 35 degrees, I actually have to have the refrigerant below the 35 degrees in order to get that heat transfer. Same thing goes on the coil on the back of the fridge. That has to be above room temperature to actually get that heat flow. So uh, there's some. Uh, differences, there's some performance issues with that, that I need that temperature change in order to get heat transfer. The other thing is that compressor needs to be uh, a dry compression, which for the Carnot, that all takes place under the vapor dome, so there would be uh, some quality with the compressor, and uh, the compressor doesn't like to do that. So in a real system, we've got to get one to two up into the vapor range, so there's that there, there's no liquid uh, because the compressor is not going to compress that liquid very well. I need all vapor at that point. The third one is it replaces the turbine with just an expansion valve. Okay, The turbine does not put out much work uh, in, a, in a Carnot cycle, and the maintenance costs and, and upfront costs are so great that it's not worth those costs to get any extra work necessary versus an expansion valve. The nice thing is that makes our analysis much easier. And again, here's our analysis. So I can find Q in and a Q out and work at the compressor all delta H. But then across that expansion valve, there's no work being done, right? Throttling valve, you know, there's no work, there's no heat transfer. So basically, enthalpy is constant. So H3 equals H4. Okay, so there's really only three states we have to find because once I find three, I know state four. Okay, and then all of the work and QNs are just delta H's, which gives us a coefficient performance of QN over the work of the compressor, which is just a relationship of those H's as shown there. Okay, so this is the actual vapor uh, refrigeration cycle that we use. Okay, the compressor and expansion valve, um, dry compression, rather than everything under the vapor dome with a turbine, things of that nature. Okay. Remember, I do have to have that temperature change in order to get Q in and Q out. Okay. So a few other aspects with regards to uh, refrigeration, and I'll refer you to the book if you want a little bit more detail on this. The first is, hey, which refrigerant do I use? You'll notice in the back of the book we've got, I don't know, like four different refrigerants we can choose from. Okay. Well, the, f the main thing is, does it perform as we want? Which is to say, am I in a temperature range that's useful for the application that I have, right? Is it a freezer? Is it a heat pump? Is it a refrigerator? You know, is it just an air conditioner? You know, what is it? And you need to choose pressure and temperature of the evaporator and condenser in order to get that heat transfer that you're looking for. So that's the main consideration when choosing a refrigerant is making sure it's within the ranges that you're interested in. We also have environmental concerns. Um, you know, certain things contribute to global warming. Uh, certain things uh, are not very good for the environment. Uh, in a lot of ways, we're trying to find natural occurring substances. That would be like the propane and the ammonia that we have uh, for refrigerants. We're moving more to those because of uh, environmental concerns and things of that nature. So those are some considerations that you take in when you choose what refrigerant you're going to use, whether it's R134A or propane or what have you. 
A couple of other things. First one is a multi-stage compressor, right? So this is basically two compressors, okay? So with basically like an intercooler in between going from two to three, you have this uh, heat exchanger that goes on uh, basically to decrease the total amount of compressor that compression that you need. Now, a key feature of that is this flash chamber that you see in here. And what the flash chamber does is state six comes in and it's uh, at some quality. And then basically it just separates out the vapor from the liquid, the saturated vapor, saturated liquid. And so saturated vapor goes out at nine, saturated liquid goes down at seven. And the amount just depends on what the quality is, right? So if the quality is 90%, 90% of the mass will go out as um, vapor, 10% will go out as saturated liquid, okay? But again, this is the sort of setup where I've got kind of multi, two compressors that I'm doing here. Um, another one is cascade cycle. This is basically two refrigerators uh, on top of one another. And we've done this several times now with the power cycles where basically Q out of one is Q into the other, okay? So again, we've got two compressors here. Generally, I'm going to have probably different refrigerants, but again, it's that whole idea of, hey, why dump it out? Why don't I dump it out and get a little bit more performance kind of idea here? We did a lot of that with both uh, vapor and gas power cycles. The other one that we want to talk about just a little bit, and again, I'll refer you to your book if you want to read a little bit more about this, but that's absorption refrigeration. And it basically, rather than use a compressor, it uses this whole kind of pink thing over here. Okay, where instead of the compressor, which requires a lot of work, we're going to use a pump, which requires a lot less work. Okay, for the pump to work out, though, it all needs to be a liquid. So then, rather than you know that dry compression, I actually want to go all the way down to liquid, and that's why I have this cooling water coming in here, reducing it down from some sort of quality all the way down to probably saturated liquid, so that I can put it through the pump. Uh, and then continue on through. So again, rather than that compression, we use uh, a pump, which requires less work. Uh, but then I do have to add a little bit extra heat here uh, into the generator before I put it into the condenser. So it's just a way of doing refrigeration without a compressor uh, if you know the application you have requires that. So these are just a few things, a uh, few different configurations that I can use on a refrigerator to change the performance, improve the performance, just depending on the application that I have.